All right. Hey guys, so topic 2.6 and the 2.7 today, all right? We're gonna be looking at the Malthusian theory, which I kind of talked a little bit about in class, all right? This goes, um, you know, with a similar enduring understanding that we've been seeing as of late, changes in population or due to mortality, fertility, and migration, which are influenced by the interplay of environmental, economic, cultural, and political factors, okay? Learning objective, explain theories of population growth and decline, okay? Cool. So here we go. Uh, Thomas Malthus, you guys. All right. So who is this guy, right? Thomas Malthus, he was a British economist and demographer who in the late 1700s developed the term overpopulation. He wrote uh, a book entitled Essay on the Principle of Population, which was published in 1798. And he developed uh, his model on population growth in it. Um, so the model, as you'll see here, is the top one here with what looks to be a green J curve. So keep in mind, you know, with Thomas Malthus that, you know, he was alive during the industrial revolution in England and when Britain in general was in stage two of the demographic transition model. And his theory and his critiques, they're used to analyze population change and consequences. Uh, and his arguments are based on two claims. People need food to survive and people have a natural desire to reproduce here. So the problem here um, is that as population increases exponentially, again, because in stage two, we see, you know, a huge population, huge population growth, right? If that's going on, right, food production is not keeping up with the population increase. You know, we're seeing food production increasing arithmetically or, you know, linear, linearly, all right? So at a certain point, there'll be something called the Malthusian trap, um, which basically means that, you know, we're gonna run out of food because people don't grow as fast as food, <laughs> as food grows, right? At least according to Malthus, right? So food production grows by additions of acreage into cultivation, whereas population grows, you know, exponentially. Okay, so based on this premise, Malthus argued that human population would outgrow or would outpace people's ability to produce food, leading to widespread starvation and disease, something he called a negative checks, all right? So nature would have checks on the population, whether it be through famine uh, or disease, right? So, you know, the carrying capacity is too much, right? Um, you know, he had a little bit more detail in his arguments, you know, like the wealthy had the burden to control themselves in reproduction because it was low, those of low SES, you know, socioeconomic standards couldn't, right? But, you know, there are a lot of issues with this theory right, technology in the future being one of them, right, people of all classes choosing to have fewer children, right, so yeah, that's his argument in a nutshell, okay, and of course, you know, he had some predictions about what would happen in the future, right, so, you know, 100 years from his time, right, so, you know, 16 persons, so that would be, what, five units of food, and Right, so you can see what, what he was predicting here. All right, the question though um, is, was uh, Thomas Malthus wrong? Um, and you know, that's kind of tricky to answer. Um, you know, it's not a simple yes or no. Um, because, you know, for one, he couldn't predict the future, right? He didn't anticipate the stages three and five of the demographic transition model. He didn't anticipate the productivity from technology and the benefits of the agricultural revolution, right? In other words, right, he didn't foresee the development of agricultural technologies and techniques, and right? he didn't fully account for the ability of people to increase food production dramatically with these you know, new technologies. He also didn't anticipate the slowing down of population growth, right? And the reason for that again, right, is because of the advancements of technology and medicine, urbanization, right? The empowerment of women, he didn't foresee that. Right, he just assumed that humans, you know, had no control over their reproductive behavior. Okay, and he also didn't predict, right, control over reproduction. Right. So, yeah. So something to keep in mind here is that Malthusian theory only applies to those in stage two of the demographic transition model, right? Because again, stage two is where most population growth is occurring. And lastly, he didn't recognize the famine, right? The lack of food in a particular place is, you know, usually related not to the lack of food, but, you know, to the unequal distribution of food, right? So, you know, he kind of came from a wealthy background. So, you know, he didn't, he didn't have that, that, that point of view, right? From, from being in poverty. 
right? So, you know, he kind of saw this in J, in J um, what is it, this J curve here, right? As what would happen in the future. And instead, what we're seeing today is kind of an S curve, right? And you could even say, you know, I mean, some countries it's declining, but you know, in general, it's, you know, an S curve today rather than a J curve, right? So, you know, there's critics of his theory, right? In his era and today, right? In his era, you know, he was kind of seen as, you know, kind of a crazy guy, right? He wasn't very pro-family, you know, and at the time, right? Like in most stage two societies, right? Large families were popular. He was also seen, seen as kind of an alarmist, um, you know, too apocalyptic, right? And today, of course, there are some critics um, in particular, you know, some, there's a Danish economist called uh, Esther Borsup, you know, his, his argument, you know, is that, you know, food supply, you know, affects, was, you know, affected directly by population size, right? So people would find, you know, ways to produce enough food. Yeah, that's one argument. But other arguments, you know, look at, you know, resources, right? You know, should they be fixed or expanding, right? Others, you know, look at population growth, not necessarily as a problem, but it's an economic, you know, gain, an economic boon, right? So it seems as a good thing. Right. Others argue, right, what if the world had, you know, adequate resources, and, you know, well, not had, but has adequate resources, you know, and what if we could be shared equally? Right. So kind of a Marxist viewpoint there. Um, another argument here is, you know, we can generate more food, right? We can generate more jobs. All right, but even though there are critics of Malthus, um, there are some who still kind of lean towards his school of thought on population growth. And, you know, that, those are the Neo-Malthusians, neo right? The new Malthusians, right? And, you know, they recognize that, you know, some of his theory was correct, right? Because there's still exponential growth happening in some countries, right? Where the NIR is pretty high, and, you know, again, stage two. Um, you know, but the Neo-Malthusians, they accept that, you know, it's just, it's not just food. That's the problem, right? It's, resources in the world, right? And so, you know, earth resources can only support a finite population. You know, I think we could agree there, most of us, right? And, you know, that puts pressure on the scarce natural resources in the world. And, you know, that could possibly lead to famine and war, right? So they believe in Malthusian's theories, um, but, you know, instead, you know, they add in the fact that, you know, instead of food, it's the world's natural resources that are the problem. So a growing population, you know, may bring about increasingly unsustainable development, right? For example, right, agricultural advances in the world in many regions may place serious strain on resources like water and soil. And so the Neo-Malthusians, they advocate for, you know, contraceptive and family planning, right, to keep population low and to protect the resources in the world. All right. Yeah, so that kind of wraps up, uh, you know, topic 2.6 and uh, the Malthusian theory and the Neo-Malthusians, all right? Awesome. So um, going along with that is uh, population policies, all right? So, you know, by now maybe, you know, you probably watched in class, right? We saw the whole population bomb video, right? So that kind of reinvigorated some, some thought into Thomas Malthus, right? And whether or not population growth is a good or a bad thing. Right, and that's kind of led governments, um, you know, to, to have some policies on population, all right? So, you know, this whole topic is looking at population growth through a, a political lens, okay? So a different enduring understanding in topic 2.7 here, right? Changes in population have long and short-term effects on a person's economy, culture, and politics. And hopefully you'll be able to explain the intent and effects of various population immigration policies population size and composition, right? So uh, we're gonna be looking at um, pro-natalist policies, anti-natalist policies and immigration policies, right? That help promote or discourage population growth, all right? So uh, we'll begin here with pro-natalist policies, all right? And these are policies that promote the birth of babies and large families. And it's done in countries where population is not growing as much as needed. Right, so again, these policies promote large families and you have to have more kids. Um, 
And there are a lot of ways this is done. It happens by governments or organizations using propaganda, offering tax incentives, making it easier for people to have children. You know, some countries will pay for daycare, hospital bills. You know, they'll, they'll offer tax breaks to both married and unmarried parents. Uh, they'll have paid maternity leave and paternity leave, right? There are a whole bunch of policies that go in it. Um, you know, again, all of this gives a reason uh, for women to have babies. Okay, and you know, this is mainly done in countries, you know, with negative NIRs or pretty low NIRs. So mainly those in Europe, uh, you know, Western and Eastern, you know, like Russia and Denmark, they, and you know, countries in Asia too, in Japan, South Korea, they have this as well, these, these policies. All right. And, you know, unsurprisingly, you know, with those countries I just named, many of them, most of them are, in, actually all of them, right, are either in stage four or stage five of the demographic transition model, right, where, again, they're at risk of dropping below that replacement rate, that total fertility rate, 2.1, right. Awesome. So, again, you know, this would help me the country maintain their population and keep a lower dependency ratio because yeah again there right the dependency ratio right you don't want to avoid that being super high right because you don't want um you know <laughs> a small population small working class right to to uh to help a, a majority right young or older population okay and there are plenty of examples um that we could look into right hungary is one of them uh, in Europe, right, they have a couple of interesting policies, right? So like the prime minister has announced during the past that, you know, he'll offer scholarships or the country will offer scholarships to university students who promise to stay in the country. And, you know, he also promised to give citizenship to ethnic Hungarians living abroad, right? He um, incentivized, you know, women with more children, right? So he said, you know, women with four or more children are exempted from paying income tax, right? And, you know, part of the reason why Hungary is, you know, having such a low population is, you know, a lot of people are, are leaving Hungary. There's a lot of immigration going on there. Right? Another example we could look at is Singapore, right? Singapore is, also has a couple of interesting ones. Um, a couple of years ago, they had a, a national night out, right, to encourage citizens, you know, to quote, make babies, right? So I think you all know what that means, right? And Singapore today, they encourage uh, uh, marriage, you know, provide support to families, including baby bonuses. They give cash to new mothers. Uh, there are financial benefits for female graduates who have more than three children, and there's paternity leave for fathers, right? And whether or not, you know, this is working, that's kind of up to debate, you know, because the TFR is pretty low. It's like at 1.1 right now, which is um, definitely not at 2.1, which is the replacement rate. Okay, we've also, uh, so, you know, those are pro-natalist policies. Uh, what we've got here now are anti-natalist policies, right? So policies that discourage the having of a children by women. It's typically done in countries in stage two, sometimes stage three of the demographic transition model to prevent overpopulation, all right? And anti-natalist policies, right? They're a reaction to concerns about population growth exceeding resources. So again, going in line with the, the neo Malthusian um, point of view. All right, and you know, antinatalist policies can take place in many forms, right? Whether it's through states, you know, promoting family planning, increased distribution or availability or affordability of contraceptives. Um, yeah, so, you know, one way you could, you know, take a guess as to whether a country is doing antinatalist policies, right, is if they're in stage two or stage three. Right, because a high percentage of young people and a lack of uh, edu edu uh, educational resources, right? If, you know, you've got that going on, right? Those people will eventually reach their, their reproductive years. Okay, and the hope is, is that with the through these policies, um, like promoting family planning or increasing the availability and affordability of contraceptives, right? The hope here is that eventually. Um, countries will move into state uh, in the later latter stages of stage three and stage four and stage five, right? Um, but then again, you know that would create problems in the future, like so, because you know you eventually reach stage four and stage five, right? 
of soup and tomatoes policies, right? There'll be a high percentage of old people. There'll be problems with funding healthcare, right? And if there's more elderly people, right? They're gonna affect uh, policy in the future, right? Because they can vote, young people can't, right? And, you know, if there's a higher percentage of, you know, older people who didn't quite get uh, education or anything like that, then, you know, that could affect uh, um, policies for that country, right? Because, you know, that affects culture, okay? Uh, but in any case, um, you got a couple of examples of antinatalist policies. Um, the most famous one being China's uh, one-child policy and later two-child policy, India's sterilization program, and you know family planning. You know what happening all over Africa, right? And um, yeah, so again. Um, this last bit here, right? With antinatalist policies, right? There's reduced birth rates, movement in the DTM, um, but you know, that will lead to conflict in culture and skewed gender ratios. So uh, why don't we take a look at them actually just, you know, so that it all makes sense. Okay. So yeah, we've got China's one child policy here. You've probably heard of it before in one way, shape or form, right? So in the sixties, uh, China's or population was growing quite fast and uh, it needed to be limited, right? Otherwise, you know, they would exceed their carrying capacity, right? So they introduced, um, at first, you know, they introduced, um, you know, kind of a, um, not the one child policy, but kind of, you know, um, a recommendation, right? To, to, to settle down, to weigh and to have less children. And that eventually transformed into the one child policy, right? So, Goes without saying here, right? Families, couples were limited to only one child, um, and they had to have a permit to have a child, right? Men weren't allowed to marry until they were 22. Women weren't allowed to marry until they were 20. And um, you know, this is all relaxed now, um, right? In the early 2010s, right? They kind of changed into the two-child policy, right? Where you could have a second child um, because, you know, the total fertility rate, you know, by, you know, 2010, you know, had decreased significantly right, in China. All right. And the question here though, is that why was it relaxed? Um, why was this relaxed later on? Part of it has to do with, uh, you know, the reduced number of adult workers in the country. There were concerns that a smaller workforce would reduce economic growth and would lead to a shortage of workers uh, to support the elderly. So that, Kind of led China to kind of you know reevaluate the policy, and also the fact that there were more men than girls, right? Culturally in China, boys are favored over girls, and uh, you know if he, you know in many cases you know when 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 a family couple found out they were going to have a girl, right? And they were often aborted or given to an orphanage, right? So China also reevaluated this policy because you know there were fears that you know because there were more boys. That would lead to civil unrest and crime because they would get desperate. Um, so yeah, China's now modified this and uh, uh, population decreased and now they're promoting more kids. Uh, the only problem here now though is that, you know, after 30 years of this policy, it's become normal and accepted to have a small family in China. So um, we'll see if China can get their TFR up, right? Another example is India's sterilization program. In the 1970s, they enacted an aggressive mandatory sterilization campaign. They were targeting men mainly. Sometimes it was forced. Sometimes it was um, done without consent. Um, by that, I mean unknowingly. Um, yeah, in recent years, it's focused on women, uh, generally in poor areas. Um, but payment there is still pretty high. Right, so India promote, promotes contraception and family planning as well. Um, for family seeking birth control from uh, health care centers, right? Uh, so yeah, they're doing this because uh, India itself knows, right, that it's projected to be the most populous country on earth, right, uh, by 2030, 2040. Um, so yeah, right? And of course, you know, as I said, you know, there'll be propaganda for pro and antinatalist uh, um, policies. So you'll see <laughs> some, some common uh, themes here, right? You know, basic promotion, right? Like this one here, <laughs> big families, problems all the way, 
see that kids here on the side playing around, you know, they can be looking all directions, right? Small family, happiness all the way. You'll see that, you know, everybody's happy, nobody's stressed. Or you'll even see the house looks better. <laughs> so yeah, propaganda, you know. Okay. Um, yeah, and Iran actually, we could look at it as one of the more, you know, famous examples, right, of an antinatalist, you know, antinatalist policies working, right? We can see through this graph here, or right, we can see that, you know, Iran had a pretty high NIR in the 80s, right, reaching 4.1, and we'll see that it declined heavily in, within 15 years, right? You know, if it had stayed as it was in the 80s, double time, the double timing for Iran would have been 20 years, you know, but now that it's, uh, you know, essentially 1.4 here, right, in today, right, the doubling time is 54 years, all right. So, you know, the antinatalist policies worked, um, and now they're, they're, they're pronatalist, right, and we can see through this ad, this propaganda piece here, right, more children, happier life. All right. And then lastly here, um, immigration policies. So uh, another way of, you know, uh, promoting, you know, controlling population growth, right? So states, countries that is, can set up policies that make it easier or harder for people to immigrate to their, their territory, right? Policies encouraging immigration. We, um, you know, in the past, you know, we could look at the United States, the Homestead Act in 1962, you know, where, you know, if you had stayed in a farm, you know, out west for five years, you'd get the land, it would be yours, right? Um, today in the United States, there are visas for educated migrants to the U.S., um, guest worker programs in other countries around the world where immigrants do the work, and we see a lot of that in the Middle East and Europe, right? Um, family reunification policies, right, that sponsors, you know, family members. So if you live here, right, if you live in a particular country, you could promote family members, sponsor family members to, to come to that country and, and, and become part of um, society there, right? Emergency migrations and foreign college student programs, right, where they offer a pathway to residency, right? And there are policies also discouraging immigration, right? Like educational. Uh, so, you know, some might have educational standards for immigrants where you have to have a certain, you know, maybe a bachelor's degree to come in, or maybe you need a PhD in certain cases, right? There are restrictions on, you know, the type of work for immigrants, right? And some have quotas, right? A limit on the number of immigrants per people, right? And, you know, policies discouraging immigration, you know, kind of stems from, for the fact, um, you know, that, you know, there are a lot of governments, people out there, you know, who are xenophobic, right? And xenophobic, what does that mean? Right, it comes from the word xenophobia, right? A strong dislike of people who practice another culture, right? So in the United States, economically speaking, there's a fear that immigrants will take jobs, right? And you could see a big example of this in, you know, the 1882 to 1943, where there was a ban on all Chinese immigrants. Uh, you know, part of that is also to preserve cultural uh, homogeneity or homogeneity, <laughs> I think I said it right there, right? Um, Japan being one of them, right? Well, they're one of the most ethnically homogenous um, uh, countries in the world, right? And they're limiting immigration, you know, but, you know, they've got that problem of, you know, underpopulation. So they need uh, working age people uh, due to the aging population. Okay, yeah, so that's it, you guys. Um, if you have any questions just let me know about this um yeah we'll come back to, to immigration here um these policies when we look at migration next week okay so keep that in mind <laughs>